All right, everybody. I'm not sure how many people are here. I know we're streaming live and we're going to start recording. And get this training going pretty soon. Do we have anybody on there? No, we can, we're just going to do it live in the group. So you can hear. Cool, let's do it. Live in the group. All right, guys, so we're here for the Burr strategy. <laughs> it's not because it's cold outside. So I want to just really quick give you an overview of what the Burr means, like what it stands for, for those of you that don't know. So the B is buy, the R is renovate, the next R is rent, and the last R is uh, refinance. So this is the primary strategy that we use to acquire our rental portfolio. I'm going to share with you, share my screen really quick. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see this. So this is one of the main tools that I use. In fact, it still has information from one of the last properties that we were working on. So this should be fun. Now, this is just a really simple tool because I like to keep things pretty simple. It's in Excel and there is a tab for each of the R's in the process. So using this tool assumes that you have already acquired the property and you've already purchased it, you've already closed and you're ready to rock, all right? So assuming that you can use this tool, we'll set a link so that you can access it if you want this actual tool, the one that we used. So there are specific steps in the rehab process. So down here, if you follow my mouse, there's a rehab tab, then there's the process for what you need to do to get it rented, and then there's the process for what to do to refinance it. So now if you look at this, I have a color-coded system. Green means that it is on track to be done on time. The blue C means that it's completed. If it's yellow, it means it's at risk. And if it's red, it means you're off schedule. <laughs> so let's start with the first tab. Now, anybody who has done real estate before already knows that, but I need to make sure that I include those that haven't. So if you haven't been familiar with the flipping renovation or rehab process, it does have a pretty simple outline or formula that you can follow. So you want to take this property and you want to break it down. You have all this renovation that you need to do on the interior, and you also have renovations that you do on the exterior. So we have it broken down where it's in chunks, really. Now, this is just a macro level. You're going to demo the interior, do the rough, the framing, the plumbing, the HVAC, and electrical. Then you're going to go through and do the tape and texture of walls. Sometimes that takes a long time in colder climates, as we found, because it takes a long time for them to dry. Then you do the basin case and the bathrooms, then kitchens with the cabinets, the, the granite, the countertops, all of that. Then it comes to finishes and just doing all the finishes, then the flooring, and then the final cleanup. Now, while you're doing the inside, you can also be doing things on the outside. So some of these timelines can run simultaneously. On the exterior, you have the demo of the exterior. So let's just say you have a wood siding house and there's bad wooden spots. You want to remove those planks and put new planks in. So you just want to go through and do any of the demo on the exterior. During that process, you can also be doing the roof. And you want to go through and look at all windows and see what needs to be replaced um, dual pane is definitely something that we recommend, especially for the Midwest and the colder climates. And even in the hotter climates, you want to make sure that the temperature does not go through. Single pane windows are just, well, they're a pain in the ass. You have painting the exterior and landscaping. So what we do is we use this tool. Now, this is, again, assuming you've already bought your property and you've already got a contractor in place. Now, you can sit down with your contractor's scope of work and with your contractor, and you don't have to be face-to-face. -face. This can be over a Zoom, just like this, and just say, hey, so I know the scope of work. It includes, and you go through and identify what parts of this process does the scope of work the contractor and you decided on, what does the scope of work include? And then you can sit down with the contractor and go through, okay, what are the timelines on that? So if we're going to demo the interior, are we demoing the exterior at the same time? And you want to really nail down when is he going to start, he or she, going to start that demo and when do they think it's going to end? Like when will that process be done? And is there anything else that they can be doing simultaneously during those processes? So you literally will just go through the entire rehab tab with your contractor and identify, number one, what's in scope of work, list it all out on this form. 
then identify when does it start, when does it finish, and then any specific notes. Like they might come back, the contractor might come back and say, hey, man, we really just, we can't put the HVAC in until we have all of this other stuff. We have to do all the duct work for the HVAC first. And they might tell you some specific things that need to come before the next thing happens. And if you're new, you want to take copious notes and make sure you remember that, especially when it comes time to juggling multiple properties. So for those of you that don't know our story, Stacy and I juggled probably about six to 12 properties at one point in time. So these tools, as you get bigger, it's going to be, it's going to be like really necessary that you have tools to track your process. And I had one of these for each property that we were going through so that we could keep track of it. Now, during this rehab process, there's two things that you could also use this tool for because you're using it for your contractor and you want to meet weekly and talk about how are we progressing to these agreed upon timelines. So you keep that project in, in motion and on task. Anytime you're approaching where it's not a green or it's not a blue completion and it's starting to approach that yellow, that's when you really want to like kick the flame up and say, ah, God, we really need to make sure we're making and moving progress here and on this area. When do you think it's going to get done? And really try to burn all your calories on making sure that the deadlines are being met or else you get your project off track. And again, the more projects you have, the harder it becomes to try and keep track of that. So this is just a tool to track every single project, right? Now, during our process, we were also flipping houses and doing buy and holds. So we had investors that were helping us. And I would use this tool when I had meetings with my investors that were like, they were literally giving us some private money that they would invest. And they wanted to know, well, what's the status of the project? And when do you think my money is going to be put to use on a different project later? How's it going and what's happening? So if for any of you, and I don't know, we haven't really talked about this Stace, but there's there is a huge group of people in here now. We have over 800, almost close to 900 folks. And when you think about it, this is a perfect situation where our group, I mean, we could, everybody in here has some sort of money that you could invest. And there might be people in here that have money that want to invest, but they don't have the time. And there's probably people in here that don't have money, but have the time. And there's partnerships that you can forge in here and really just go after and get your cash flow and try to figure out what's the best partnership there. And if that's the case, then using this as a report and being able to have a weekly meeting with your contractor and then find out, well, where are we on everything? Then turn around in a day or two later, have a meeting with your investor and say, okay, I had a meeting with the contractor. This is where we are on everything. And keep your investor happy because at the end of that project, you want that investor to be able to say, well, shit, I don't want my money back. Well, put it back to work. Go get another project. And that's really like, that's where the juice is worth the squeeze here. And then let's just say you go through and you get everything completed on the property. And as you're approaching the completion of that, you want to start thinking about, I got to start renting it. So what are the steps to rent it? And that's what the next tab comes in. So let's look at this just really quick before we go over to the other tab. I want to just point out a couple of things. Let me see if I can orient myself. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like we were trying to get this entire property done by April 30th. So on April 30th, I want to try as hard as I can to get somebody in there renting it from me as close to April 30th as possible, right? So because as every day goes by, if you're not getting rent, you're paying, right? So when you go into the rent tab, we can start the process of renting the property in the February timeframe. So about two months before you're ready to actually put a tenant in there. And here's some of the things that you need to do beforehand. So you have the actual rental process, which means... You have to find a property manager. Now, some of you might want to be your own property manager. Some of you might say, oh, hell no, I'm hiring somebody. And some of you might say, no, I want to do something hybrid, which is what we did. We wanted to have control over who was rented, like who was renting from us. We wanted to be able to make that final decision. And sometimes when you go with a property management company, you don't have full autonomy with that. And so in order to protect yourself, you might want to be heavily involved in that rental application combing through it, making sure you know who's in your house because it's an asset and you don't want it jacked up, right? So there's, you can hire a property manager company. You can be your own property manager. It's ill-advised. I don't advise doing that. Or you could do a hybrid version and then work with the property manager that would accept a certain percentage of rents, knowing that you're going to do a certain portion. And then you spend your time just really clarifying rules and responsibilities for each of you. If you have questions about that, we can answer that at a different time. So determining your property management strategy, then determining how you're going to move forward with that. 
Then you have to come up with an advertising plan. You have to pre-screen tenants, which means on the phone. So anybody that's like interested, expressing an interest, pre-screening them on the phone, scheduling showings for that property, and then doing the application process where you're actually checking their credit and vetting whether or not they're a good enough candidate to stay in your property. Now, the tenant screening is when you actually, when you get to the point where you're like, okay, this is somebody that I'm actually willing to invest the time and burn the calories on figuring out a background check, employment verification, landlord verification, rental history, going through the whole nine on them. That, that process takes a little bit of time. Lease preparation and signing is something that you need to do. And then collecting the funds and actually verifying utilities. And trust me, we got burnt once. <laughs> we had somebody, we didn't verify that they turned utilities on and we ended up getting a utility bill. No bueno. So I advise, let's put a checklist together. And now we have a checklist. So let me talk to you about that because it only takes one time to get burnt, right? So we have a process implementation. This is our best practice for what we do to get things rent ready by property. So we have a move-in checklist. And on that move-in checklist is now verify utilities. <laughs> the monthly rent collection process. How are you going to do it? Now, some folks out there have their property manager go around and actually collect rents. I feel like that's really archaic. And you need to have a way to be pretty flexible on how you're going to collect those rents, but also how you're going to track them and keep track of your rent rolls. And you want that process in place before we get to the third tab, which is refinancing. Um, the maintenance process. So are you gonna have a database where they can go in and enter, hey, this is a work order, I have my sink is stopped up. Or if you're in the Midwest, we've had a couple of catastrophes where you know we've had pipes that froze and busted. So they fill out a work order. And then what does that process look like after they fill out the work order? So you have to have that maintenance process you got to have an eviction process and then a lease renewal. Now, one of our biggest strategies is we do not want to incur turnaround fees on a unit, right? And I'm sure you can understand why, because the longer we can have a tenant in that property that is very well vetted, super responsible, on time with their rents, treats the property with class, I want that person to live there as long as they possibly can. Because the more I have to turn over a unit, the more cost is involved. So I'm always trying to make sure my property manager is doing a good job building relationships with the tenants. I'm always trying to get you know another lease out of them. So if it's making deals where it's you know an 18 month lease, okay, cool. Well, if you sign up for a two a two year lease, we'll put the rent at this amount. And you'd think, oh man, I don't really want to miss out on the extra rent and increasing it. But when you do the the math on it turning the unit around multiple times actually costs more. So, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Stacy's playing around back there. I heard myself talking while I'm talking, it was weird. Anyways, you wanna make sure that you minimize the amount of times that you are turning the, the unit around and incurring that cost. Then lease renewal is part of that. If you can renew a tenant, it's basically gonna be dependent on the relationship your property manager has and how good they're performing to the needs of that tenant within reason. Obviously there's boundaries. As long as they're a good tenant, they pay on time and they're doing the right thing. You wanna treat them with respect. You know, we're not slumlords here. So we wanna make sure that they're getting a good brand experience from us as landlords. And then they're probably gonna to wanna to sign again, right? And then unit turnaround, like I said, anytime you do a unit turnaround, it does cost money. And sometimes, you know, it could cost anywhere from 500 bucks to 2,500 bucks. You never know what, what's going on. So that's why you want to be a part of that tenant screening process. Trust me. So let's just say you got all that done and you got it done by April 30th. You got, you got the tenant in there, right? You're doing great, by the way. Then we go to the refinance section. Biggest question we get is, how long do we have to wait before we refinance the property? And it all depends. You know, there's that gray area of life, but it all depends. So while you're waiting, while you are getting this unit rented and you're getting somebody in there, it's always a good idea to just interview lenders and identify what are their seasoning requirements before they will allow you to refi or even consider you refinancing it, right? So you wanna go through and be doing that. Spend your time, find the best lender, find the best rates. And during that time frame, you also want to make sure you're doing some credit credit maximization strategies around that so you can get your credit score back up after going through this process. I know that for us, when we were doing renovations, we put a lot of stuff on the credit cards. Well, that tanks your score. And as soon as you start taking some of the profits and paying it off, it gets your score back up. And then you are well positioned to do the refi that you need to do. So there's a couple of strategies and loopholes that you kind of got to juggle through, but it's all worth it. Then 
what you got to do in order to qualify for that refi is compile all of your documentation. So all of your purchase documents, all of the rehab documentation, all of the costs involved, all of that. And then you're going to have to come up with all of your property rent rolls, all of that documentation with the leases, the tenants, and you're going to have to show a certain percentage of occupancy and what those rent rolls look like. Then you, after you have all that information together, you can actually do the application. I would say you probably want to do the application about 45 days before you really want to get that refi done. And then an appraisal comes in. You have to get it appraised. And then you end up closing. So when we say we started the rehab on this property, let me go back to the rehab. Okay, January 10th, 2018. The refinance was closed and done by November 30th. So it took 10 full months, almost 11 months to get it completely done. So that gives you kind of an idea. Sometimes it's six months before they'll refinance it. But these tools right here, what I would do, and I mentioned it before, if you're working with an investor that's given you some private money and has a vested interest in knowing man, what in the heck is going on with the property? I want to know, you know, when do I get my money back? When can I get it to invest in another deal with you? Are you still moving and, and going quickly? Like, what's the deal? I would take this information for every property that we had, and I'm going to do one more screen share. So I would, I would highlight it like this after I filled it all out and talked to my contractor and entered all of my notes. And then I would put it on, let's do this again. I'd put it on what I call the four block. So this was something that I learned in corporate America. So I take some of my some of my skills that I got in corporate America about reporting to higher management, right? It still applies in the business ownership world and entrepreneurship. You still have to track and measure stuff, right? And there's still, at the end of the day, there's still somebody that needs information. So you have to have some reporting tools. I would copy that and I would paste it on here. It would have the property address and it would show the entire process. So here's where we are on this property and, and let's just say we were in the beginning stages where, man, I'm just barely in demo and all this other stuff is not even done. I wouldn't even put it on there. I would just explain, yeah, that's what's to come and walk them through it. But here's how we're on track. And down here has the grid, green on schedule, yellow at risk, red is off schedule, and the, the blue C is completed. So anytime I was getting ready to get in front of one of my investors, I would die if I had any yellow or red on here. And because of that, it kept me highly engaged in the process to keep that contractor moving forward. So this is a pretty cool reporting structure. In case you guys have any investors that you're working with, let me go back to that other tool. Okay, so buy is the B, rehab, renovate is, this, is the first R, then rent and refinance. This is the tool to use where it encompasses everything. And at this point, I want to take questions. Are there any questions out there? You can put questions in, in the chat or on the page. I know we're live on Facebook right now. So if you have any questions that you want to ask on the page, go ahead and I'm actually going to put it on my other screen so that I can see you. Actually, I lied. I can't get to it. There's no questions. Cool. Man, does that mean I just explained it really well? <laughs> well, we're going to save this and we're going to post it on here. And if you can think of any questions. Oh, we have a question. Oh, we do? Okay. Um, where would you find your investors? So the question was, where would you find your investors? That's a great question. So now... You could find anybody, like if they have real estate networking events that we went to. We started in San Diego right here where they have, what was the name of that? This REI. Some, it was like a, um, a monthly networking for real estate in the, in the area. So we would go to that. And it was really cool. Like you check in and you have this little badge and you get there and they're like, okay, so are you an investor? Are you a real estate agent? Do you have a deal? What is it? And so they would organize it. So you would wear this little sticker and it said, I have money if you were an investor or I need money, if you were somebody that had a deal. And so when they had their networking power hour, you just look for the specific label and what the word said. So if you needed money from people, you went around and looked for the labels that said, I have money. So that's one place that you can go. You can definitely go look for investors in there. And then I would say leverage the people in this group. If anybody in here has a deal and doesn't know what to do with it because they don't have the, the funds and there's people in here that 
have the funds but don't have the time, and maybe there's a way that we can bridge the gap on that. And maybe we can actually post something in here and set it up and organize it a little bit so you guys can find one another. Uh, a couple other questions. Um, Bobby asked if we if they can see that move-in checklist or get a copy. Um, possibly, I'm going to work on making that available. Okay, uh, so Bobby's question was, can we see the move-in checklist or get a copy? Is he talking about the one that you just showed? And I, no, I think he's talking about the actual move-in checklist that we have for our tenants. Okay, okay. yeah. So yeah, we, we will get that posted and out there. Um, it is part, yeah, for whoever, I know Bobby, I know you're going to be in that uh, master class, that eight-week master class, and Stacy has that in there. Um, so you will have access to it then. Um, Teresa wants to know if you can make it larger on the screen. Teresa wants to know if I can make it larger on the screen. Let me see. And we can messenger the actual document to people who would like to have it. Yeah, I'm going to put a link out there so that you guys can have this. I don't know if Teresa can hear me, but this is probably as big as I can get it for now. There we go. Yeah, so... I'll get you a link to this and I'll even leave the timelines in there so that you guys can kind of get a feel for what they should look like based on what we've already proven works. Um, yeah, I'll do that. And then, oh yeah, that looks much bigger. So does that look better? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Colleen is asking, is the refi to take equity out or to just get a better rate? The answer is yes. <laughs> so the question was, is the refi to take equity out or just get a, a better rate? And here, here's the deal. The answer is yes. Um, the, the refi is because if you are going in with a hard money loan, they usually last six months at a time. And so you want to get it into more of a conventional situation. Um, so it's more long term and a better rate. It will naturally become a better rate because of that. Usually, usually. And yes, you can pull equity out. I wouldn't suggest doing it all the time. I think there's a strategy behind that. And, and I'm sure Stacy's going to cover that during the mastermind, that eight week mastermind. Um, yeah, I think so far, I don't see any other questions. That's no other questions question. so far. Okay, yes, we have one from Braden. Braden. Is there any nationwide hard money lenders? If so, have you used anything like that or is local better? We'll be interviewing someone. Yeah, we're actually interviewing Braden. So, oh, Braden's. Yeah, Braden's question was, are there any national hard money lenders? Have we used them? And what does that look like? We're going to be interviewing. What, what day is it? It's going to be on Thursday. I think around noon. I'll announce it tonight. Yeah. On Thursday, we're interviewing one of the, the hard money lenders that will be of interest. So you, you're going to want to tune in. It's going to be live. He's national. Yes. And he's national. Yeah. Um, Dalia just, Dalia just said, I'd love to get a link. We can make the link available. I'd also like to be able to deliver it to them via Messenger in the actual Excel document. Okay. Um, so we can, we'll, we'll make both available. All right. So Stacy's behind me and she said, we're going to make the link available and we're going to actually be able to deliver the Excel document to you through Messenger. So if you want the link and you want the document, please comment, put notes right now, comment on the post that we're live right now in the Facebook group. Just put a comment and say Excel, and then we'll know you want it. So I don't see any other questions, but no problem. Sometimes taking it in. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you for stopping by. And uh, like I said, go ahead and put just type in the word Excel in the comments, and then we'll know that you want the specific link and the file. Okay. And for those of you that are in the eight-week uh, mastermind, I, I know that you're going to really enjoy it. I know that Stacey's going to cover a lot of the details, more, more details once you finally get into that class about the checklist, the tools, the systems that we use. Um, you definitely will get that as a part of your course. Cool. All right. I think we're good. Thanks for tuning in, you guys. Have a good one.